Beloved, hear the words of scripture this morning from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verse 1 to 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because of the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just a few days ago, I joined people from around the country in a virtual grief and healing circle. As space was opened for persons to voice what was weighing heavily on their hearts and minds in light of the announcements related to Breonna Taylor, many were angry, frustrated, and even moved to tears. The convergence of the political, social, and physical realities of the nation had devolved. The ongoing injustice perpetrated in communities of color, the name calling, the bullying, the racialized fear, and the politicized rants related to this pandemic have parched the souls of the people on the call and across the nation. Unilateral action has replaced consensus. Polarization has replaced compromise, and acrimony has replaced courtesy. I couldn't help but wonder, is God among us? The covenant of human relationships seems all but lost these days. And like the children of Israel, for many of us, especially brown and black folk, but not just people of color, our souls are distressed, depressed, and desolate as we find ourselves in a wilderness bereft of hope. For myself and for many of our souls are being crushed in our hopes for some kind of recognition of our humanity dashed. And I find myself crying out in anger, quarreling with God. Why? Because my soul thirsts. But not only my soul, the soul of this country is thirsty. This is what happens when you're in a crisis of hope. Today we find the Israelites wrestling with making their way toward the promise of God, complaining every step of the way as they move towards liberation. We find them pleading with Moses again. Why did you bring us out of Egypt just to kill us and our livestock with thirst? They are in a crisis of hope, frustrated, fatigued, and wrought with fear. They hunker down in camp and wait for Moses to make the impossible possible. Even though they left Egypt with booty and treasure, no amount of material goods can truly satisfy a parched soul. There are some things money just cannot buy. There are some material goods that cannot always meet our needs. There are some resources that can only come by way of creation and the creator. And so, again, Moses counsels with God and God offers him the solution. Take the elders and go to Horeb. I will meet you there. And when you strike the rock with your shepherd's staff, water will pour out and all will drink. God is once again solidifying the reality that some needs and some situations can only be met by God. And as I read this text, I have to remind myself of how easily it becomes to see the children of Israel as them. How easy it is to want to castigate them as folk unwilling to, or better yet, unable to make it on their own. In the context of our contemporary culture, they are failures. 
But then I am reminded that I should take solace because of their crisis of faith. In their moment of disappointment and lost hope, in their time of desperation, this is where God meets them. And that's good news. God will meet us at our point of need when we go to God because God loves us and God will never forsake us or leave us. We serve God who never forsakes the covenantal commitment made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the chesed of God, the unfailing love and enduring willingness of God to love people from beginning to end, no matter where they find themselves. Even as they feel defeated and are in despair and quarrel and cuss out and cry out in anguish, God's chesed is not deterred. And even in their abandonment of devotion to God and in the chaos of human to human relationships, God does not abandon. That's the hope I need to hear in these times when I feel like I want to give up, when I don't want to discuss race relationships anymore or march yet one more time because it seems the needle of social, social justice once moved only gets pushed back in every facet of my community's life. Yet God, God doesn't give up on me, and God doesn't give up on us. When I think of the ancestors of Oberlin Village, and no matter how much they accomplished in the development of a community, no matter how much education they achieved, no matter how they saved and saved to buy their own homes, they still were parched. Parched because they suffered from not being seen as fully equal by everyone in society. Parts because no matter how successful they were, it could never be enough for some. But when they gathered on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evening for Bible study or for choir practice, their souls were again replenished and they knew that they needed to strike the rock of their salvation because when they struck the rock of salvation, they were renewed in their minds and in their souls and in their hearts to know that they were the people of God and they were somebody. Striking the rock renews the spirit. It revives the soul and it renews the mind because in the rock is found the hope of the world, the hope of the ever sustaining presence of the living God who did not see them and does not see me and does not see you despite our flaws and faults as less than, but sees us as enough because we have been created in God's image. God's action of providing water in their time of thirst is a reminder. Living in these times where unrest, agitation, and anxiety rule the atmosphere. There is no place so deserted, no place so lifeless, no place so God forsaken that God is not already there, ready to be poured out, poured out in love. Beloved, God meets us in our situations of desperation, but we've got to strike the rock. The sustaining presence of God, the rock, in the midst of our parched difficulties of crisis, grief, and suffering is a powerful reminder that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. No matter how desperate the situation may seem, we have a rock, even in the wilderness, but you've got to strike the rock. I am reminded that even with all the discontinuity of the wilderness, the desolate existence it offers, it is never without some resource when God is the source of our sustaining strength and the strength of our life. We may not be able to see the source of strength in our midst, but it is there because God is with us and where God is, there is nothing that we lack, but we've got to strike the rock. I am reminded that God sees differently than I am able. God can make a way out of what I see as no way. In my parched existence, there is still hope. I may not see it, but I got to have enough faith to strike the rock. I believe what we have in this text is really a deeper call to a deeper living. The call to lean even more deeply on God, trusting in Jesus in these perilous times. We are existing in parched and weary days. Where do we find water? Well, we have every technological advance available to us. We have all the things that we could ever want. Yet we are still thirsty. 
Our thirst can only be satisfied through connection. We have churches filled with folk who may gather weekly, but still are thirsty for more than the world can give. How do we embrace with joy this life of faith when we live in this parched land? We follow God's commands. God commands Moses to strike the rock, which becomes a call for deeper living. Strike the rock means to lean on God and not to our own understanding. Strike the rock means to put your faith and trust in Jesus and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Strike the rock means to cultivate joy in the practices of prayer and a Bible study and of singing the songs of Zion that meet the needs of others, even in difficult moments, cultivating the joy in the practices of providing food pantries and serving others, even while we're in this wilderness. Striking the rock is trusting that there is a way forward, even when it seems like there is no way. Strike the rock when you don't know which way to go and you're at the end of your rope. But someone's saying, how do I strike the rock? Well, when we gather week by week, in person or online, with our worshiping community, we're striking the rock. When I share my gifts and offer myself as a living sacrifice and service to God, I'm striking the rock the rock to heal another who is traveling in this weary land. Of all the things you could be doing today, you have chosen to be here online in worship or perhaps maybe even in person. You've chosen to be present though, lifting up your hearts in worship of the God who provides even in the midst of what seems like hopelessness, the God who is present even when it seems like we are all alone. You are engaged in striking the rock even as we travel in this weary land. And when you reach out to others, when you share the love of Christ with others, when you extend yourself beyond your own needs and meet others' needs, you are striking the rock. We got to strike the rock. And Jesus is that rock in our weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. It's an old African-American spiritual, but it reminds us that no matter what we're going through, no matter what might have come our way, no matter if no one sees me or recognizes me as being fully human, no matter how I might have been denigrated, put down and despised, Jesus sees me. God sees me created in God's image. And as a result, when I strike the rock, the weariness will go away because Jesus will provide all I need. A rock in a weary land of the pandemic of distress, dis-ease and isolation. If we call on the Lord, Jesus is a rock in a weary land of broken race relationships and forsaken promises that neglect some and privilege others because of their skin. But the hope of the gospel is that regardless of skin, it's the blood of Jesus that makes us kin. This is the good news we must stand on. The good news of God's promise. The promise that comes in and through Jesus Christ. The good news of Christ is God's action of pouring out God's self for us. Sacrificial love. The good news of Jesus Christ is not God's way of pretending that our suffering and parched souls don't exist. It is rather God's way of offering promise and hope in the midst of our thirst. Jesus is our rock in the weary land who satisfies our souls and heals our hearts so we can live in this covenant of love, love of God and love of neighbor. A cross-shaped love. Jesus is a rock in our weary land. Will you strike the rock this week? Call somebody. Share some gift of yourself with someone else. Reach out and let them know that yes, while it may seem like we are in the wilderness Season at an extended time, God is with us and has promised never to leave us. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. 
God bless you, beloved.